In 79 CE, two thriving Roman towns full of bustling commerce, laughter, and everyday experiences were changed forever in a matter of minutes. Although there had been warning signs in the form of small tremors and distant rumblings for many years, the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum didn't really understand that the top of the mountain whose shadow they'd been living under for generations could actually be blown into the sky and rain deadly clouds of unbearable heat and suffocating ash upon them. As an anesthesiologist, I spend my life thinking about what the human body can tolerate or fail to tolerate when it's stressed to the max. In this video, I'll use what I know of physiology, heat injury, and asphyxia in combination with the archaeological evidence from the eruption of Mount Vesuvius to reconstruct what those final minutes and seconds might have been like and try to answer the question, what did the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum really experience in their final moments? In 79 CE, Mount Vesuvius erupted violently and destroyed several Roman settlements, the most famous being Pompeii and Herculaneum. There appear to have been two broad phases to the eruption. First, a plume of ash and pumice called the Plinian Column rises up into the sky and then begins to spread out and fall back to the ground, creating heavy fallout over Pompeii and its surrounding areas. Then in subsequent hours, maybe even overnight and into the next day, parts of that column collapse sending dense, ground-hugging pyroclastic surges or flows down the slopes. These carry intensely hot gas, ash, and volcanic fragments. The town of Herculaneum, being closer to the volcano and near the sea, was particularly impacted by these surges. Many of the victims in Herculaneum were found in waterfront grottos and even along the shore, apparently fleeing for the sea. Archaeologists have recovered hundreds of skeletons at Herculaneum, but Pompeii's human remains are harder to study in detail because many have only been preserved as voids in the solidified ash that were subsequently filled with plaster. These are known as body casts, and their haunting figures have become famous around the world. In the end, these people were overwhelmed, not just by falling ash, but by a series of fast, high-temperature surges of lethal gases and particulate matter. Before we zoom in on what people may or may not have felt or experienced in their final seconds, I want to step into the realm of physiology, thermal injury, and the extremes of what the body can survive. First, thermal injury and heat shock. In modern medicine, we often talk about hyperthermia or heat stroke, but what happens when temperatures are not just one or two degrees higher than usual, but several hundred degrees higher, or even over 500 degrees Celsius? Under these extreme conditions, irreversible damage happens at the cellular level. Enzymes, the cytoskeleton, and organelles, including mitochondria, all collapse. Proteins denature almost instantly and cellular membranes begin to break down. And water inside cells flashes to steam, generating internal pressure, causing them to burst open. Essentially, the body tissues get instantly charred and that's unrecoverable. You don't get a gradual failure of these systems to function. You get a pretty much immediate physical structural breakdown. Second, let's look at the nervous system and the brain. The brain is exquisitely sensitive to heat. Normally, just a few degrees of hyperthermia can cause swelling and edema which can lead to confusion, seizures, and eventually unconsciousness. But at very high temperatures, neurons and glial cells just kind of vaporize or char. In one case, scientists found that the brain of one of the victims in Herculaneum had transformed into a glassy, vitrified kind of stone inside the skull. That suggests exposure to extremely high temperature, over 510 degrees Celsius in that case. And then extremely rapid cooling, preserving microstructure in that vitrified state. Third, let's talk about asphyxia and gas toxicity. We know that heat wasn't the only killer in this disaster. In the pyroclastic surge or flow, the gas component of the material ejected from a volcano is composed of superheated ash, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and very fine particles with extremely low humidity. If you would inhale this scalding gas, you'd instantaneously cause irreparable damage to your airway, esophagus, and lungs. Even if you survived a partial exposure, the interface between the alveoli and capillaries in your lungs would be destroyed and you wouldn't be able to exchange oxygen or carbon dioxide with the atmosphere. So you'd be suffocating from lack of usable oxygen as well as the inhaled particulates blocking the alveoli and sooner or later inflammatory shock. Even in modern medicine, severe burns to the airway are catastrophic and ingestion of superheated gases causes immediate edema, sloughing of tissues and airway obstruction. None of those things are reversible in a scenario like Vesuvius. Lastly, let's look at cadaveric spasm and muscle contracture. One interesting phenomenon is the so-called pugilistic pose seen in many of the plaster casts or skeletons. They have their arms flexed, their legs bent, and sometimes their fists are clenched, 
Traditionally, some thought this meant the victims had died in a defensive posture, but in fact, it's more consistent with cadaveric spasm or heat-induced contraction. That's when intense heat causes rapid contraction of muscles at death, freezing the limbs in that posture. These aren't voluntary movements. They're the involuntary final twitches of muscles subjected to extreme heat. So now that we know some of the ways extreme heat can affect the body, let's walk through a likely scenario at Herculaneum, minute by minute and second by second, based on archaeological and forensic evidence. During the eruption, many people likely tried to flee, but the evidence shows that some people also sought shelter at the seafront or in vaulted chambers along the shoreline. As the pyroclastic surge approached, it would have arrived as a dense wave of gas and ash moving at extremely high speed. Its leading edge is called a flow front, and is often the hottest, fastest, and most lethal part. Thermal modeling indicates that the first pyroclastic surges in Herculaneum were likely extremely hot, but relatively low in density, essentially a superheated gas wave rather than a thick flow of ash. The discovery of the man with the vitrified brain supports this, suggesting that victims were exposed to a brief but intense burst of super high temperature within this initial dilute surge. When the first surge arrived, we'd probably see these five things happening. First, flash heating. The skin, exposed soft tissues, and external organs are subject to instantaneous heating. Nerves in the skin would be destroyed too fast for any pain perception. Victims wouldn't even feel a burn. The heat literally robs them of the ability to sense any pain. Number two, airway devastation. Any inhaled gas is gonna be superheated. The larynx, trachea, bronchi, and alveoli are catastrophically damaged. Breathing would cease immediately as the lungs are destroyed. Three, cardiovascular collapse. The heart muscle would also be cooked and electrical conduction would be disrupted, so the pump just stops. Vascular walls would rupture, causing internal bleeding, capillary collapse, and catastrophic shock. Number four, brain and central nervous system shutdown. Brain and spinal neurons would probably all cease to function all simultaneously. That means immediate loss of consciousness, pain, and awareness. Number five, muscle spasms. The very final muscular contraction, that cadaveric spasm we spoke about earlier, fixes the limbs in place. That's why many skeletons appear contorted in that boxing pose. The total timeline from initial exposure to the cessation of all vital processes is likely on the order of seconds or microseconds, not minutes. Now let's talk about Pompeii. The sequence of events here is trickier to reconstruct than at Herculaneum, because so many of the victims are represented as casts rather than intact skeletons. The plaster casts replicate the voids left by decomposed bodies in the ash. However, some actual skeletal remains do exist, and there are anthropological studies that inform us about the range of possible injuries. Dr. Estelle Laser, whose PhD thesis was based on the human skeletal remains discovered at Pompeii, has interpreted that the main causes of death likely included 1. Asphyxia, suffocation by dust, toxic gases, and airway obstruction from ash inhalation. 2. Thermal shock, extreme heat waves inducing immediate cellular failure. And 3. Concussive trauma, collapsing buildings, falling debris, and roof collapse due to ash load. Even in the earlier phases when ash was still falling, breathing might have become impossible before heat alone killed everyone. Then later surges overtook them. The Pompeii casts often show people in collapsed postures, crouching, covering heads, huddled, sometimes shielding or turning away. Because the ashfall phase lasted for many hours, some people might have had several minutes of distress before the final surge, but once the pyroclastic flows arrived, the destruction would have followed a rapid collapse scenario similar to what we discussed for Herculaneum, though possibly with slightly lower maximum temperatures in some areas. In one modeling study, the temperature in a late surge in the Pompeii area is estimated to have reached around two to 300 degrees Celsius, and possibly more depending on proximity. At those levels, just like at Herculaneum, fatal injury is almost instantaneous. Thus, though the victims of Pompeii might have had a brief tale of distress during ashfall, their last moments were equally swift under the advancing surges and flows. Now I want to emphasize a few common misconceptions and correct them using a bit of medical reasoning. First, the misconception that the victims burned slowly, crying out in agony. Because heat injury is so sudden at extreme temperatures, pain receptors and brain function are lost almost instantly. They just would not have had any time for conscious suffering. The damage is more like a microsecond flash kill, not a drawn out burn sequence. Another misconception is that they coughed, choked, and suffocated painfully. In dense, ash-laden gas clouds, airway destruction is immediate. Any attempt to inhale would bring superheated ash and gas into the lungs, causing instant edema, ignition, or collapse of alveoli. So suffocation as a slow process is unlikely, 
the heat itself inhibits breathing immediately. There's also the misconception that some people might have initially survived, only to then die slowly in the following days or weeks. The archaeological and forensic evidence suggests there was virtually no intermediate survival time once the lethal surge front hit. The vitrified brain case points to instantaneous death at extreme temperature, followed by rapid cooling. Most of the skeletons show no evidence of movement or struggle. Now let me walk you through a possible narrative of the final few minutes for someone in Herculaneum, blended with physiology and a bit of dramatic detail. Keep in mind that this is a reconstruction, not a recorded story. Let's start about five minutes before the pyroclastic surge hits. Our protagonist, let's call her Olivia, is in a protected stone-lined cove by the sea, sheltering with friends and family, hoping the worst is over. Ash has already rained, but darkness and choking dust still fill the air. Breathing is getting more and more difficult, and everyone huddled together here is coughing and panic is visible on everyone's faces. Some people succumb to suffocation from inhaled particulates, while others are debilitated by ash clogged in the airways, unable to inhale fresh air. Then, about one minute before the surge hits, a distant roar can be heard, and waves of pressure sweep over them. Suddenly, Livia senses a massive change. Superheated gusts slam into the walls of the cavern. A pulsing wind throws everyone around the room like ragdolls, and a burning wave of heat rolls over the room. Within a second, the ambient temperature spikes catastrophically, and the air itself becomes scalding hot. At the moment of impact, Livia's skin and superficial tissues are flash heated. Surface moisture and cells vaporize. The thermal damage to her airway mucosa from the trachea all the way down to the alveoli mean that air can no longer be exchanged and she can't breathe. There's massive hemorrhaging from every vessel in her body, leading to a loss of blood pressure and cardiac arrest. Her brain and central nervous system cells fail within milliseconds, and she instantly loses consciousness. Her muscles then contract in heat-induced spasm, fixing the limbs in that pugilistic or boxing pose. Livia has been mortally incinerated, and the only things left of her are ash and skeletal remains, which are soon buried under hundreds of tons of volcanic deposits. Now, you might be wondering, okay, but how much of this is actually backed by evidence, and how much of it did you just make up? And that's a fair question, but the reconstruction I just described isn't from my imagination. It's built on several solid lines of research. For starters, there's the skeletal and cast evidence. Many of the bodies were discovered in those tightly contorted postures, consistent not with panic or struggle, but with the muscle contractions that occur at the moment of death under extreme heat. Then we have that amazing find where brain tissue inside one victim's skull was transformed into glass. It's our most direct proof of exposure to extraordinary heat, followed by rapid cooling. Thermal modeling studies add another layer. By analyzing the magnetic properties of the volcanic deposits, researchers have been able to estimate the temperature of those pyroclastic surges, and they match perfectly with what would cause instantaneous fatal injury. Meanwhile, analyses of bone fragments reveal patterns of heat-induced protein breakdown that confirm that these people were exposed to some extreme temperatures. Even the volcanic layers themselves tell the story. The stratigraphy, the way the ash and surge deposits are stacked, shows the sequence and timing of each deadly wave as it raced down the mountainside. And finally, anthropological studies of the remains, like those by Dr. Laser, show that these weren't just the weak or sick that were left behind. They were healthy, ordinary men, women, and children. In other words, no one's physiology could have saved them. All of this evidence comes together to paint a consistent picture. Nearly instantaneous death from a combination of overwhelming heat and asphyxiation. As anesthesiologists, we often think about unconsciousness, sedation, and preventing suffering. However, in this ancient tragedy, the heat wave, tissue destruction, and asphyxia struck so fast that the victims had no time to react and no chance to process what was happening. Within milliseconds, vital organs failed, nerves were destroyed, and consciousness would have simply vanished. So, what did the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum really experience in their final moments? Well, thankfully, in terms of conscious suffering, the answer is probably nothing. Hey guys, this is the first time I've done one of these historical, forensic, physiologic deep dives, so drop a comment letting me know if you thought it was interesting, or if you didn't. Come on. So drop a comment letting me know if you thought it was interesting. Also, let me know if there's any other historical events or catastrophes you'd like me to cover from a medical perspective. I love history, so I'll probably do it if you ask nicely enough. All right, thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.